tonight, both uh, those that are out here to speak to us and those who are here to observe, and also for all of you, wish you all Happy New Year. Hope that the New Year brings good things to you. Um, first item on our agenda tonight is um, review. So I'll ask Jeremy to go ahead and hand that for us. Uh, so today we have um, the CCTV proposal. We're going to discuss that. Um, and following the break, we have the chief's presentation, the court overtime breakdown question that was asked in the last commission meeting. So it'll be a little bit of a follow up to that. And then um, a vehicle impound policy review um, that everybody should have received in their packets. And um, on my part, I want to apologize because it just brought to my attention that there is an old draft of the minutes that made it into the into the um, packet, and it is got name errors and uh, as well as many other technical errors. So I apologize for that. So um, we hope to everything. Uh, Bob mentioned we'd probably have the thing rounded up earlier tonight than usual. So. Yeah, possibly. So, but thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, and we understand that those things do happen, so it's no big deal. Okay. And the next item on the agenda is public comment. And just in time, <laughs> in the nick of time, our vice chair will uh, go ahead and. Okay. Are these any of No. Okay, so first on, we have David Jackson. And where do you want him to step up? Why don't you step up to the table, David, and have a seat? This one or this one? Here you go. Any one of you like take my seat here. Oh. And you'll have three minutes, and when you have 20 seconds for me, and I'll hold this, and then you're done. Do I get to count it? Hello, my name is David Jackson. I am a citizen and property owner in Eugene. I'm here today because, like many citizens of this country, I've been deeply disturbed by the recent events in Ferguson, Missouri, and in Staten Island, New York. In Ferguson, while there is some ambiguity about the facts of Michael Brown's death, the disproportional and unjustified use by police to subdue protesters was appalling. And in Staten Island, a law enforcement officer choked Eric Gardner to death, but was cleared of charges by a grand jury. I found each of these outcomes outrageous and intolerable. I'm here today because I believe that better policing begins at the community level. I did not hold the Eugene Police Department responsible for the events in Ferguson or in Staten Island. But as a citizen of this country and of the citizen, I'm here to demand reform to our police oversight systems to reduce law enforcement involved deaths and hold our officers to the highest level of accountability. The public puts a dangerous and sacred responsibility in the hands of our law enforcement officers. I believe there is evil in the world, and I know that day over day it is our law enforcement officers who face that evil. Statistically speaking, however, we see that minorities in this country are the collateral damage of our imperfect justice system. We have a justice system, but we do not have justice. We have a justice system, but we do not have justice. The benefit of living in a democracy, however, is that we can change these systems. We must change these systems. I'm here today to propose three reforms that could improve our system and increase accountability. I'm not a legal scholar. I'm simply a citizen with proposals for this commission to consider. Number one, I would like the city of Eugene to expand the use of police body cameras. I applaud the early adoption of this technology, which EPD has done, and I believe that we can be leaders in the use of this te technology for quality policing. Number two, if it does not already, I request that the Eugene Police Department immediately and completely participate in the FBI's national database of law enforcement involved deaths. It is asinine that this voluntary, this was a voluntary system, and I will press for this to become federal law. Since I wrote this, it has now been passed by the Senate. However, this commission can immediately make the commitment to participate in the current database. I would also like to have this commission explore the feasibility of using independent civilian review boards and independent or special prosecutors for police brutality and law enforcement officer involved deaths. When I look at the statistics of brutality and law enforcement officer cases which are put before grand juries, 
the improbably and the improbably improbably few indictments which are returned. It is clear to me that there is a deep flaw in the handling of these cases by the district and state's attorney's offices. Now, as I said, I'm no legal scholar. This is only a proposal or part of an idea, but it's an idea worth discussing because we have to improve our justice system. We have to improve our justice system so that the senseless killings of Eric Gardner and other victims of law enforcement custody deaths are remembered. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Carol Burkholdo. I stand. I sit too much of court. <laughs> Carol Caldwell, 2510 Augusta. Greetings. I am looking forward to hearing your discussions tonight regarding impound policy and police court overtime pay. Today I scanned Assistant Chief Durr's info in your packets detailing court overtime pay from July through December 2014, less than 50000 This is a remarkable, notable drop in overtime costs from information Carter Hawley had provided me about a year and a half ago. On average, the previous three years ran about 260000 per year. If Assistant Chief Durr's data for six months past remains consistent, a year's worth of overtime will be less than 100000 Like said, notable drop and commendable. Today I also received input regarding overtime pay for detectives, which I'll be discussing soon with Mr. Cleversey. This too may be something to drill into. Regarding impound policy, I hope efforts will be made to invite patrol officers, other police, to share thoughts and input. I had a compelling conversation with an officer which helped broaden my own understandings about the how and why behind officer discretion, whether to impound or not. I know area law enforcement agencies have varied impound policies. At court, I regularly see the rollout of incidents involving impounded vehicles, including vehicles that are virtually the homes, so to speak, of unhoused community members. As you saw in the video aired at your last meeting, officers can and do utilize that officer discretion in whole view community values ways, and that too is commendable. Finally, at your December meeting, I presented you with materials pertinent to three separate court proceedings I'd observed, where the involved parties expressed deep-seated beliefs they'd been punished by police, allegedly due to police objections over <coughs> being recorded. I asked that you craft a policy that could address the needs of police to not be unduly interfered with by civilian recorders, but could also address best practices and procedures to guide police when they do encounter civilian recorders, a frequent occurrence. One case involved a man who had complied twice with police orders to step further back. Eventually, he did object to even more demands to step even further away, as would have placed him out of recording range. He was quickly tackled, tased twice, arrested. From initial police orders to step back to the double tasings, 45 seconds. Watching ICV aired multiple times at that all-day trial, I got a sinking feeling that other civilian recorders could experience what he'd endured. Potentially costly impacts could be prevented and avoided via a clearly defined delineated policy, such as that very costly Josh Schlossberg matter, the smashed cameras city lost big time in federal court. No doubt, community could gain more awareness, too, of the need for police to do their work without undue interferences for the safety of police and all involved. I hope you will craft a policy as this, tall order but possible if you have the will and interest, and I hope you do. I hope you have a great year. And by the way, since I have a few seconds, Chief, since it looks like you're saving about 13000 a month in overtime, let's talk a bit. Maybe there could be a special cash bonus award given to police who rise to exceptional and high standards of performance. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel. Would you say your last name? Malinga. Thank you. I Hi, I'm to... Rachel. Can I start? Hi, I'm Rachel Malinga. I came last month. Um, it was brought up that there was concern about police recordings being abused, possibly from the, by body, the, the police recordings by body cams, by the public or ICV video being showing, um, depicting people's homes, um, violent acts and so forth, and being posted on YouTube. And I looked up on YouTube and it's not legal to post acts of gruesome violence or shop videos, so forth, on there. So. I so there's no concern about that and that aspect. That's all. Thank you. If there are, is uh, nobody else in the audience wishing to speak, then that concludes our public forum. Thank you. Paul, I'd like to send time back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'd like to um, open the comments tonight with uh, Commissioner's responses to thank the people who came and uh, thank your preparation. It appears that both of you, have, all three of you actually, have written comments and written presentations to make to the commission. And it portends that your well thought out uh, ideas are important and uh, they are certainly important to us anyway. So thank you very much for presenting them the way you did and we appreciate the input. Um, from there, I'll move to uh, who would like to go first there. <laughs> Have any volunteers? I'll move around the table. George. First of all, I hope this 2015 finds everyone in this room and all your friends and in good health. And uh, I find it still a privilege to be on this board. And I wanted to address to David, um, there is a Citizens Review Board. I'm part of it. I find it very, very thorough. So uh, to give you some surety that that is been for a while, and I, my opinion is they do a really good job. We have great debate in there. Also, we here and there, particularly the Citizens Review Board, are really, really encouraging body cams, in-car video cams, uh, and we have found them to be a tremendous, tremendous help in the Citizens Review Board because, you know, they say this, they say that, but when you have your video, you have a little more unbiased uh, uh, option that you can look at. So I, I really think actually the Eugene Police Department is very far advanced in that, thanks to uh, Chief Kearns on that. I don't have a, uh, any report from the Citizens Review Board because we are black on uh, in January. Uh, so I'll get twice the information next uh, time. And thank you, Rachel, and you for, for bringing up the stuff. It's really important, at least I feel it's important, that we get the view from uh, citizens out there to help us do our job. So I thank you very kindly. Thank you. No comment. Um, thanks to everyone who spoke, and David, thanks for bringing up the FBI National Database. I'm going to ask that the chief, if he knows the answer to that, at some point tonight, maybe during your presentation, um, let us know about that. I think he came with that question. Okay. What was the name of the National Database? The, the question is whether the city of Eugene currently participates in the currently voluntary uh, federal database of law enforcement involved uh, Yes. Uh, it just passed the Senate. It will be federal law. I don't know if that's effective. Previously, it was voluntary only. It will now be mandated, and federal funds will be tied to compliance with that. Yeah, not to put you on the spot if you know or don't know, but I was curious about that. Uh, I don't believe we do. Okay. Uh, but then it, there may be an automated uh, report that goes to the FBI that I'm not aware of. So I'll look into it. We'll we'll send it out in our next. Weekly update. There's a lot of reports. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. Sorry. Okay. Oh, good. I just want to thank everybody, all the speakers tonight. I appreciate the, the information that, that you guys always bring to us. So thank you. Well, happy uh, 2K15, which is a new buzzword. Nobody says 2015, 2K15. So I just want to get that out there. I said, you heard it first here. <laughs> so first off, uh, I uh, want to thank everyone that came out. Uh, that was a very, uh, uh, very detailed uh, presentation that you made. I really uh, appreciate that stuff. And uh, I ask that you may even want to consider uh, participation on police commission. You seem that you are, you know, you're very involved with the community, and that's what this this body is about and stuff. So I hope that you would consider that as well, and any others that are out there uh, to continue on this because this is a reflection of we represent your you your values and your thoughts and stuff. And as uh, time move on, of course, everybody changes over and stuff, and we need to make sure that we have qualified, quality people who are reasonable uh, and willing to come forward and share can can uh, constructive. Uh, conversation engage and it would be most welcome here I do want to say also uh, that to uh, to this body here I am uh, and feel always privileged to be a part of this because uh, what you bring and what you offer makes me stronger uh, it gives me the confidence that I can go out and I can talk 
about our police department, about our police commission, and spread the word. Many times when I am in D.C., I use uh, EPD and reference EPD as a model of, of policing and stuff. And that's virtually due to the work that's the combined work and efforts of this body, this commission, and to a police chief who is very visionary, and, and to a police department who is open to change and, and, and accepting responsibility. But I will also encourage that the citizens of our community also realize the fact that uh, most officers are only going to run across 2% uh, uh, of the population, which are uh, the criminal activity uh, portion. And then once the news media get it, then it's all twisted. I would encourage uh, the community to be more involved with the police, uh, know your police officers that come around. And I had uh, suggested a institution of a policy or practice where you kind of wave at an officer. So if the officers are out driving and somebody wave at them, tell them that they're not trying to flag them down and just saying thank you, you know, hey, and you know, we're glad that you're safe too. Uh, thank you. Everything that James said, except I hardly ever talk to people in D.C. Uh, but, <laughs> but I do uh, appreciate every one of you that comes to comment from the public to us, especially our regulars, because honestly, you're our eyes and ears in places that we cannot get to, um, either because of our schedules or other circumstances, so we do appreciate that. I would second what James said. Think about the fact that there are always vacancies on this commission and on the Civilian Review Board. Just a thought. Um, some of you know that my position, the liaison from the Human Rights Commission, is an annually appointed position by the HRC. This is the last meeting of this year's term for me. So there is the slight chance that I will go to the HRC next Tuesday and some hard-charging youngster is going to want this position and, and manage to talk the other commissioners into voting them in, which I would not fight, much as I love working with you. <laughs> I'm also getting old and tired. However, I haven't heard that there's anybody else out there, so I look forward, hopefully, to being with you at least another year. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I have these uh, DVDs that I promised James last time. They're about the City Club um, panel on uh, bias-based policing and the response the week following. So again, if anybody's interested in a set of copies, I'm willing to make them. Um, so that's the first thing. Let's see. Now, uh, I did a couple things. I did read this thing, um, which... I kind of found somewhat troubling, um, specifically about uh, the issue of the community recording the police and um, the response to that that uh, appears on these documents. And um, I guess one of the things I'd like to, be, I haven't actually gone back to the video from the last meeting, but the issue of looking at a policy that um, talks about uh, citizens recording um, officers. Uh, if I remember correctly, we talked about that last meeting, but it disappeared from the minutes. So um, is that, what's the status on that? Can you repeat that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I raised the, we had, we had a couple people talk about um, recording, of, recording of the police and that's, essentially what this is about, um, and suggested that uh, we look at a policy um, to do that. And my understanding in the last meeting is it was sort of like a general, everybody's nodding yes that we wanted to do that, so no motion was made. Um, so that, we don't see that, okay. Um, well then, I guess ultimately I'd like to make a motion that um, a policy be drafted um, for review uh, that, uh, looks at the issue of citizens recording um, police uh, during normal act normal activity or during their activities. We have a problem. We made a motion. We have a second. I'll second for the discussion. Okay, the discussion. Jesse? Seems like we did talk about that like a un unanimous consent issue last month or a couple months ago okay don't remember, don't remember go ahead either. Let, let jesse finish for no if, if george remembers yes. better yeah i i i brought a request from the citizens review board uh that the uh, citizens filming police is there any policy 
or is there a, uh, and then I went on to another policy. But I did say last time that it would be nice to set some kind of, not arbitrary police decided, but some kind of policy to say how many feet is acceptable. So it's in black and white. And I did say that last, in the last means. I, I guess it didn't get into the notes, but on a scale of zero to 10, I'm positive I said it. Okay, I do, I the minutes saying. record, and I do recall your issuing uh, request about hair pulling, and I asked for a clarification on that. So and, and right before that, I have it written down. Okay. Uh, that I said, uh, CRB back to the police commission. Citizens filming police, any policy on this? Is there a policy on holding hair or stepping on hair? I didn't only the last things. of it, so uh, I apologize. And that's not Either way, as was mentioned by uh, Joe, we didn't have a motion. So next on the list is Claire. Do I have others? Uh, <clears throat> so, Chief, is there any kind of policy or, or written procedure for officers dealing with folks who are trying to film their activities for an arrest or an interview or anything currently? No. No. Um, I, I think... I, I would support the motion. I think um, it would be good for us to at least explore the question. We may not develop formal policy, but I, I seem to recall other departments having policy around that, just in terms of giving guidance to officers and how they should engage with citizens, not necessarily a policy that dictates to citizens how close they can be, but that would be a whole different uh, thing. So I would support the motion that Joe's put forward. Okay, Edward and then James. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really conflicted about this one because on the one hand, it's not only my job but my beliefs that citizens have the right to record officers or any other government employee going about their job, providing there's not some matter of national security or it's too dangerous an area for the civilians to be near. It's a bomb, who knows what. That said, being too close to some police action, and by two I would define you're putting yourself in danger, is something to consider. Uh, somebody getting in close enough to get audio can be close enough to be grabbed and used as a hostage by somebody seriously bad the police are attempting to cope with. Uh, shots could be fired. Very practical things. The problem with saying a citizen can be 15 feet away is how far away from me is that gentleman sitting right now? Right. There's not demarcations on the pavement. And everybody involved in a situation like that is kind of a bit worked up and on edge. I used to write a crime column in San Francisco, and one of the things that I would bring up, oh, at least monthly, was that we had eight eyewitnesses to this incident, and every one of them disagreed fundamentally and what they saw. So I'm concerned about a judgment call, either by citizens or police, as to how far away is far away enough. Too far away, you've got no audio. Or if your zoom is not good, you have no detail, if you're recording. Too close could be fatal. So I, I just want to tell people, keep these things in mind as we're talking about this, is it's not just rights and accountability that we're balancing here, but also safety. Everybody's safety. And I don't know the answer to this one. It's not an easy one at all. Uh, you, know, you can't give them a poking stick and say, they're, that, they're far enough away now. I've got the stick. They're far enough away. So, uh, okay, I have James, Tamara, Joe, and George. Okay, thank you. I just want to kind of um, uh, Hotel off of what Edward just uh, uh, just expressed. Uh, as a former police officer, uh, I know that when I had gone out to make a, unfortunately, when I had to do conduct an apprehension and stuff, that uh, my focus was on uh, the person uh, that I was charged or had committed the crime, uh, not looking around to see how close anyone else was because anyone else close behind, there had been incidents where. Uh, the officer was attacked unknowingly because they were focused on their jobs. We have to remember too that police officers are human just like you and I. Uh, how far away do you, would you like someone to be from you if you are engaged in a conversation or something like that? I understand that there is a difference that they do maintain, uh, uh, they carry life or death uh, on their hips or on their persons and stuff. 
uh, but there are others out there that do the same. So I think it's a good conversation, but we have to kind of remember and, and look at it that there are two sides to this. If you were an officer and you were making an apprehension, how close would you want someone uh, to you, to your back, to your side, and will you really be concerned about them making a, a recording of what's going on? Is, would that be one of your priorities? Uh, would you stop, as, as Edward has said, okay, you have to be an arm's length or three arm's lengths away, and I'm going to guesstimate that, and then if you fail to comply with that, what is the next option? So this is one of those ones that's worth having a conversation for, but I, I hope that we approach this very reasonably and also look at it not only from the side of a citizen, but the side of the officer as well, because we have to take their, uh, their position under consideration. That is very important. So, just like other policies that the police commission's worked on um, and that the department has in place, the totality of the circumstances is the language that's typically used to give the officer discretion in each situation about what's safe and what's not. A certain distance away in one situation may be safe in one situation but not safe in another situation. And so I don't think that you can dictate distance. I, I think that that needs to be left up to the discretion of the officer. Um, so I would not be supporting working on a policy to that. Having said that, um, I do think it would be um, a good idea, and I would encourage the chief to look at the policies that exist already in the um, training manual and the other things that the officers use to do their jobs and see if there's any way to give guidance for how you or see if something's already in there about um, how you assess the situation and the totality of the circumstances to determine. Um, I, I wasn't there, I don't know the circumstances when somebody was tased twice in 45 seconds. I've seen people be very aggressive in certain situations and put um, both officers and um, other citizens at risk. And so I wouldn't want to try to parse myself what and say what those situations would be. I, I don't think you can put that in a policy. I don't think you can make a list of those things. I think you have to make sure that your training is good and that your procedures are good and um, leave it up to officer discretion. I mean, they are carrying weapons. They're trained to use those weapons and, and um, force when it's necessary. And to me, that's more about use of force and looking at um, how that's trained than anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is aware of, of the events in New York, also the events in Paris, um, and in, you know, looking at this, uh, which does, you know, look at some specific cases of the issue of citizens recording um, the police in Eugene and the responses of the police, and there, you know, in addition to that, there are a number of cases that I am aware of, of previously of this kind of thing. Um, probably the classic one was the little battle between uh, Allie Valkyrie and Officer Schulke about her recording him and, um, and the trespass, criminal trespassing ticket that he gave her for that. Uh, we also have some other things like that. But the other thing that I did was I went up onto YouTube and started looking at videos. Um, now there's only a few that appear to have gone viral. But there are literally hundreds of recordings of uh, police, um, you know, made by um, citizens uh, of some fairly extreme violence uh, out there. In fact, a couple of deaths um, that the videos essentially went nowhere, did not become viral. Although, uh, if you want to go for a group that actually looks for this stuff, and um, so you can find, you know, if you go through their videos, you can find a lot. There's a a new alternate news program called the Young Turks um, and they usually um, they have several million subscribers they've been around for quite a while and this is one of the things that they will do is go find these videos and um, play them and comment on them and a lot of the ones that do not go viral so there's uh, they would have relatively few views if they weren't being showcased by an organization like this and some of them were pretty were uh, pretty horrific um, so, 
you know, in other words, if, if you look a little bit, there's a lot of evidence that there is a clear need for a clear policy um, that I don't think we want to leave it um, completely to discretion um, at this point. But I think that they're, you know, respecting the, the suggestions that both Edwards and, Edward and uh, James made, um, I think we need to uh, really look at that policy very, very carefully. Um, but again, I think it's a, a matter of contention that has been there for quite some time, and I do seriously believe needs a resolution. Thank you. Is George next? Ed, Ed, Edward, I heard you say, what is 30 feet? What is nothing? If you don't have any policy down there, uh, yeah, it's, it's so wide open, and I, mm -hmm. I agree with Joe a little bit. It would be good to have some... Mm -hmm about number. Just that uh, they're not arguing against the policy. Yeah, right, right. Okay. I just I just wanted to say it would be good to have something. And 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 with James, you know, sometimes it's real you know, I, I couldn't imagine being real focused on what I'm doing and focused on I'm gonna use the word life and death matters because you know some a lot of these are life and death matters and then having to uh, say, you know, are you you're 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 24 feet, get back 25 feet, whatever the arbitrary rule is. So, you know, I mean, it's it's a very, very difficult, it would be a very, very difficult definition depending on the intensity of the engagement of the officer or officers at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the second round, is anybody that had not spoken yet that would like to speak besides myself? Well, James, we're going to go yeah, right. second when round. You, yeah, we're second, second round. round. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, um, I would just like to, you know, go ahead and put my two cents in the pot. They, um, this has been a nationwide issue about filming police ever since I can remember. And we had the cop watch here years ago that took actual video cameras back then and, and filmed it. And the issue is not if the police are being filmed, but how often and when is all that's involved here. So my my concern is that if I had a policy, it would say two things. Citizens are allowed to film police at any time. Two, do not let citizens filming police interfere with your actions that you take on the street. I don't know what else uh, we want to do as a commission to restrict the police ability to um, to keep the situation safe, as James pointed out, and Edward pointed out, these are these are decisions that are made based on the circumstances of the moment, and I don't know how in the world we can sit here and think of the many many circumstances that would be involved that would dictate how the police respond to situations. I I just don't know how you would do that. But having said that, I'm willing to have the administration draw something up that they think might be workable and that we might accept and, and take a look at it. I have no, no problem with them doing that. I, 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 just, uh, I just don't think it can be done. But that's just my opinion, so thank you. And we're going around the second time, so starting with Claire, then Tamara, then James. Thanks. Um, really good discussion. Um, I, and I don't think there is a way to create a distance that's measured by units of feet or meters, because it's all going to be variable. Um, and I do think that even if we were to craft a policy, that officer's judgment would probably still be the overriding factor in, in how it's implemented, because they are the folks on the scene dealing with the situation. But kind of just as George alluded to, um, providing pol having a policy provides a framework. It doesn't necessarily restrict, but it provides a framework for both the police and civilians and uh, provides police with a backstop against which they can respond to complaints like the ones we've heard recently um, so that they're not just being seen as indiscriminately making a decision about where they're asking someone to step back to or why they're asking someone to step back. To. So they've got policy to protect them as much as to protect citizens from some kind of abusive situation. Um, and I think having the discussion and whether or not we form a policy gives the community confidence that we've looked at this situation and we've thought about it and we've we've asked officers about how they handle this and 
you know, as James was talking about, sometimes it's not a distance but line of sight. If an officer can see that person recording them and they're not standing behind them, then they can feel confident they're not going to get jumped, right? And they can still do what they need to do and know that that person is there even though they're recording. Um, so those are some of the thoughts I have in terms of why I think it's valuable for us to um, have this conversation and see if we can craft something. Bob may be right. We may It may be too hard to capture all of the variables, but I think um, we owe it to both the police and the community to at least attempt. Okay, Tamara and then James, and then you all actually you have been around, so yeah, you chief, want to get the chief. The chief, okay. Do you, you want to go ahead to Jim? Um, sure. I, on uh, sure. Um, I was kind of waiting to kind of hear all the comments. A lot of people have some good things to say, and I this is a tough one because I think it, it does it is going to come down to officer discretion although I think having as Claire said I and George also you know having having a baseline to go on at least so so the public has something to see also that that this is you know part of the training and um, that there that there is something that is up to the officer discretion so they the officers are well within their rights and what they should be asking for is 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 safety because it's not just for the safety of civilians, which it is because you are talking about you know death on the hip as as James mentioned. Um, I mean that is a dangerous situation, and if an officer is involved with something, they're concentrating on what they're doing. If they get startled, you don't know what's going to happen because you don't you know then they're taking their um, eyes off of what they're trying to do. And depending on what that type of situation is, that could, could spell danger for the officer and for whoever is around. Um, so I think it will come down to officer discretion. For the most part, I wouldn't, I, I think I could support at least putting something into policy or into um, at least adding some guidelines to it so that um, officers have something to see and the public also has something to see. Um, but definitely, I think it'll end up, as I think most have said, is it'll end up to really to officer discretion, which is kind of what it is now. But um, and hopefully that will the officer dis discretion and what I think will still be probably further away than civilians want it to be. But I think for safety, it almost has to be. I think there's the 21 foot rule, if I remember right, from going through some of the some of the trainings that and that's when you're focused on somebody you've got to have somebody 21 feet and if you're not ready that they can cover that 21 feet before you can do anything and that's then they're grappling with you and then that's you know never know what's going to happen there and that's when you're focused on somebody and ready for action let alone anything that's going on behind you or off to the sides I mean they could be further away before you understand what's going on and could be too late so Maybe I've rambled on too much, but I think it's a lot of things to cover, and I, I'm not sure we could, I definitely know we couldn't put every situation into a policy, but I think some guidelines could be good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Chief, and then Tamara, James, and Edward. A uh, couple points I'd like to make. First, is this really, how much time do we want to invest in something when we don't know really what the, how great the problem is, or if there is a problem. Um, the stories you've heard about have a very different version than the one you've heard here. So we really don't know what the realities of those are. Uh, other, I mean, we know one reality, but we don't know the one that the judge heard and ruled on and uh, convicted these uh, three defendants on. Uh, so there's that factor. Um, as I mentioned last time, uh, police officers uh, that are in places where people can video them, downtown, uh, West University neighborhood, just about any place where people gather will we make an arrest. We're being videotaped all the time. It's like being looked at. Uh, to uh, establish a rule for how to be safely uh, videotaped um, or what distance to ask somebody to stand, um, could be, you know, writing a policy that's um, obsolete because of the number of people who videotape officers. I'm not saying that we don't look into this. I'm just saying asking how much time 
we should put into it. There's also a phenomenon that uh, is related to this where um, someone will, uh, just by the act of videotaping something, I mean, much greater than 90% of the people that videotape officers who are in the act of uh, uh, conducting an arrest do not create any problem whatsoever. They're respectful, they stay back, they must have some sense of the distance that they should have because they're not asked to get back. That's almost every single person that videotapes police activity. And then there are a few people who feel this uh, need to be close enough that uh, they put the officer in some danger uh, and are unwilling, for whatever reason, the subconscious desire to get a good view or the belief that the officers don't want them to have a good view or whatever combination of things that make the officers um, time with the dangerous person that they're encountering and the videographer very difficult. And they ask them to get back, they refuse, and then we end up with the stories that you've heard. Um, I, I, I think what I'm just sharing is sort of the, the, a list of all the factors that are worth considering before we launch uh, our administrative staff on developing, you know, composing a draft policy that doesn't exist. And all I ask is that if you want us to look into this, which is a legitimate request, because uh, uh, I understand the concern, uh, in fact, before there were videos on cameras, the concern was also that we were asking people to get back believing that we didn't want them to see what was about to happen, not that we didn't want them to. So it's not new. Uh, we can uh, research whether or not there are policies on this already in the world, and if they are, share them with you, and then based on that, you can make decisions about how much more work you want to put into it. So mm -hmm. that's, those are the things I wanted to share. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, James, and... Uh so two things. Um, one is that um, I, I'm just not comfortable jumping to, we need a new policy on this. When we haven't looked at what policies are out there this may already be addressed in, that are already part of the police operating manual, or what policies already exist today or training procedures where a one sentence could be inserted and take care of the concern. I think Bob's suggestion that it just, you know, that we have something that says that citizens can videotape police um, or something like that would probably just be a proactive statement to make. I don't think we need to create a new policy for it. I think that could or may already exist, maybe not those exact words in an existing policy. So if we're wanting to go down this road, I think we should look at what's already in place first, not jump to that we need something new. The second thing is that um, both this motion and this subject are out of order. Um, because they're taking up time on the agenda that it's not set for the subject. Um, not that it's not an important subject to discuss, but it's out of order. And the second thing is that um, about that is that it's also not in our work plan. So it's up to the pleasure of this group about whether this moves ahead of other things already in our work plan or things we're already working on. But I think we need to make that decision deliberate, deliberately. Look at what else we have in our work plan that we said we were gonna work on because that's what we said we were gonna work on and what was important, leaving room for emerging community issues. But I think before we decide this goes to the front of the line, we need to look at what else is on the list. So. Um, you reading so, a point of order? Well, I, I mean, I'd like people to finish the discussion. I think it is an important um, subject, but I'd just like to raise the point that this is taking up time on the agenda when it's not on the agenda. So, so we'll if we call, could move the discussion along. I, we'll call it a point of information then at that point. We won't call it a point of order. Now we'll well, rule not, on it. Well, okay. It's not a point of information. I don't need information. It's well, not on the agenda. My <laughs> point is, if you're raising an objection, I have a responsibility to rule on it. Do you, are you raising a point? I of am order? raising an objection, but right. I'm fine the with whatever rules that the made. motion is in order. Someone would like to appeal that decision, you're welcome to do it. Okay, then we'll continue. James. I, I agree that, that it kind of got some legs and stuff, and it's, it's, it's off to the races, uh, so I'll be very <laughs> brief. Uh, I, uh, to the fact that uh, when we talk about audio recording, I recall on my ride along, uh, the officer uh, did have a recording, uh, and he informed uh, the person of interest that uh, he is now recording uh, the conversation. So the police officers have that capability, and, and they are, they've also, you know, they do that, and they, and they do it very well. Uh, uh, I am uh, to try to develop a policy for an officer to, to direct an officer to uh, specify a distance uh, when they're engaged with a perpetrator 
Um, <coughs> it seems like that would be very, very difficult to do. I mean, I can multitask, but when my life is on the line, uh, I'm, so, I'm strictly focused uh, on the issue at hand. And I could probably care less if someone wants to audio record me because that's not what this is about. This is about public safety. This is about me returning home after my shift is over. I think that uh, to try to set some type of guideline as to how close to let someone because they feel that they need to or want to or desire to record an activity uh, is something that's not practical. Uh, I, I can't see that happening and, and it's based on the fact is that we're all human. Uh, if there is an incident and I am engaged, totally engaged, and this is serious, and any time that they're engaged is serious, whether it just be a, a mere jaywalk or the, there used to be a phrase about a routine car stop. There are no routine car stops. Everyone is different. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. So you can't make a determination based off a, what seemingly starts off as an innocent interaction. Case in point, the, uh, the uh, uh, sheriff deputy that was killed in California, it was perceived a routine and it, it resulted in his death. And there is a countless others. So to try to uh, to say that we need to develop a policy on something that's unmeasurable uh, doesn't seem practical to me. I think that uh, relying on training, uh, those things matter. You know, what type of training that the officers are receiving, and perhaps uh, the officers can come up with something themselves. Have we ever decided that we're going to ask the officers what they think? Edward and then Joe, and then we're going to cut off discussion so we can uh, call the question. Good. I was about ready to call the question. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I was told by a citizen yesterday that there are local uh, nonprofits that may be advising uh, people who want to observe or record the police to get as close as 10 to 12 feet. And that surprised me um, just in terms of everybody's safety involved. So my advice would be that if we are going to do anything with this, and I would question whether there or not are already policies that may cover this, that we work with those groups <coughs> to get a mutually agreeable, realistic notion of what's going on here. You know, if people are being instructed to get in close and the officers are so concerned for their safety that they are having to take action about that, that's just going to happen over and over. So that's a, that's a cycle we would have to break. The last thing I want to say is an officer's responsibility for the safety of the people around him and her includes someone who is video recording them. And the conscientious officer who's in the middle of a situation which may be unsafe already now has to actually expand his or her umbrella of awareness and concern to take in this person who's recording them and think about their safety. I just want to add that fact. This is, this is not an easy thing to make a policy about and not an easy thing for someone in the moment to keep the policy in mind, even if they had a 20-foot stick to use. Because so they've got other things on their mind. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Joe? Uh, yeah. OK, I guess this discussion um, was much larger than I would have anticipated. <laughs> And it, I think that's probably um, an interesting comment on the issue itself, that there are, you know, there's a lot of concerns and it, it definitely pushed people's buttons on this one. But I think a lot of the discussion really would be better had if we actually had a policy to look at. Um, so I think it's, it's really a lot of what we talked about tonight is premature. Um, several people here said that um, the concept of it is okay to video uh, for example, one of the, the problems in this packet was a confiscated uh, cell phone. Um, and so, you know, that, um, that's a problem. In other words, why was the cell phone confiscated? Um, you know, and uh, that's, that seemed inappropriate to me. And I think Edward's point specifically about the community, I think, um, we have an opportunity, I think, to do a service to the community that if we were to work on this, that we could interact with some of, we would have a purpose to interact with some of the organizations that do put out 
uh, information about video videoing the police and maybe get a better overall agreement so that everybody's kind of on the same page and I think that would be a service to the community so I think we have an opportunity there um, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that um, oh actually actually I, I did have one more point uh, I was willing to make a friendly amendment to this thing in response to what Chief Kearns suggested which is maybe it's premature to draft a policy um, maybe it would be better to do some research and look at you know what the policies the current existing policies are um, and that would give us a better place to start and then uh, at that point we could draft a uh, um, we could we could request a drafting of a policy and I'm willing to make that friendly amendment if that uh, would make folks here happier you are the maker of the motion so you would yeah. be able to restate it so any, any way you want so just restate your motion then. And okay, well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, if, if folks want something a little more serious, I mean, could I at least get a nod from folks that you think that's a reasonable way to go? Yes. Okay, I think I see consensus. So uh, my motion is to request that uh, the chief um, find uh, existing policies and present them for, um, uh, for consideration, and then we'll move from there. So that's restating my motion. Are you still good with the second, James? Yeah, if there are in fact any, if there are in fact any existing policies out there, so you know. Okay. Okay. I have, I have, a, I have a point of information. Yeah. Go ahead. Could that be in a Friday update, or is that something that's trumping everything else left on our work plan? Because we only have till June thirtieth to finish the two-year work plan we're in right now. I don't know what else is left. Okay. Uh, Chief, you I'm sorry, I shouldn't interrupt it. Uh, no, that's all right. Sergeant Lowen advises that he could have something within a month. Okay. Okay. So we have the motion now as restated and reseconded to find existing police policy on filming of police <coughs> and to report back to the commission. Recording. Uh, I'm sorry, recording. Yeah. Uh, filming and recording. Let's make it both because there's audio and video. So we want to make sure we have both. filming and recording police and. We have a second, proper second. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. No. No. No, no, no. I'm opposed. You got that. Okay. We're good. We have moved, uh, moved through um, into our time for reviewing the minutes, but I'm going to ask my motion to table the review of the minutes until they can be corrected. Second. Draft policy. We have a motion. Point of order. We weren't done with the previous. Um, subject matter on the agenda which is commissioner comments that right, thank you thank you for it thank you for, thank you okay i guess i guess that, that out thank you that leaves me and and i had three very quick things um number one i guess for claire when are we going to get our new person is there any talk about uh, uh, the replacement commissioner we have that on the agenda later. oh we do we do yes yeah, i don't know <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I, oh, I don't see that on it. But okay. I thought we did have a report on there, but I guess we don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so it's with the mayor, is that right, Jeremy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's with the mayor and the mayor will take it to Okay. The so no, no, no motion or, or stuff on the agenda. Yeah. We yet. Just wait for them to come to us. I was so. expecting someone this week. Okay. Um, the second thing that, that's that sort of troubled me a little bit was I discovered that the CRB is no longer recording its meetings. Um, and I just wanted to sort of throw that out and say there seemed to, you know, that kind of troubles me a little bit. Uh, the third thing is that I did meet with uh, Captain Durr and Lieutenant Klinko uh, concerning uh, looking at body-worn video. It was a very interesting, and I, and I learned quite a bit at that meeting, and uh, just wanted to mention that that had occurred. Thank you. So, thank you for... We took a lot of time. Thanks. Yep. I guess up to me, and I'll, so I'll try to be brief. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight and the comments. They're very well received. Um, one thing that, that, that was troubling for me, um, and it seems to be that there's always a lot of talk about the deaths in um, Ferguson and in New York, but they rarely talk about the officers that were basically assassinated in re that appears to be in retaliation for those deaths, um, and what is even more appalling to me, uh, I guess it can't be much more appalling, but 
that I believe both those people were also of minority descent, um, which was also, I mean, to me that's just, you know, doubly bad where you're protesting, you're doing something that's so heinous like this um, in protest of killing or of the deaths of a couple of minorities and then a couple of the minorities were killed because of that. Um, but I do always feel it's very sad that, that those officers are not mentioned also. Um, so that's my comments tonight. Thank you, Tamara. So um, Springfield Police Department has announced that um, COPS Concerns of Police Survivors has declared tomorrow, January 9th, Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. So I wanted to mention that in case you weren't aware. And um, I also wanted to let you know that on December 24th, the afternoon of December 24th, Christmas Eve, um, myself and my family brought uh, six dozen sugar cookies that were in the shape of the police badge um, to the um, building here with a thank you note from the police commission. Um, thanking the officers for their service. It took me longer than I thought to get the cookies done, but finally, <laughs> but finally, so hopefully they had something nice for the officers that had to work on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and could be with their families during that time. I don't know if they were good or not. I didn't open the box and taste one because I wanted to leave them sealed for um, purposes of seeing that they came from, straight from the store and were tampered with. So yeah, you never know. <laughs> so I didn't taste one, but I hope they were good. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out we still weren't finished. And uh, now that we are, uh, I'll take a motion oh, to table the minutes. No, George. He's started. Started. George. George oh. Yeah, so we're okay. Um, I'll take a motion to. Uh, well, you, you made one. Table the. Mo well, I'll make the motion at the table. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Second. The motion is to table the minutes until the next meeting when they can be correctly uh, uh, given to us. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's carried. Thank you very much. On to um, the next item is the CCTV proposal. Um, I've been informed uh, that the administration does not have a written proposal at this time, but we, I have supplied, and if you haven't picked it up, there may be some left over there on the table, a, an executive summary that appeared in your packet, I think in the November packet, of uh, different CCTV programs. Uh, I'd just like to say that I do have the entire so for every summary, I have a complete packet here from each one of those uh, summaries that you're welcome to look after, but I can tell you it's kind of boring reading, so I mean, if you'd like to, you're probably better off with sticking with the summary, but I wanted everybody to take that home, read it, think about it, decide uh, where you want to go with this so that when we do get the proposal, uh, that you'll be prepared with some information about um, what other departments are doing and and other places suggest regarding the use of CCTV. Uh, having said that, we also have time to discuss further uh, your comments and your suggestions to help guide the uh, administration on how, how it is you see um, uh, the use of this equipment. And, uh, for instance, at last meeting I heard comments regarding whether or not the video should be monitored in real time or whether it should only be used in the event of a complaint uh, to be able to pull from whatever hard drive and, and those kinds of things. So I'm getting a sense of you're creating in your own mind what it is you'd like to see this become. Um, and then there were some people who didn't want it at all. So I, I want you to uh, take this time that we have set aside to, to uh, discuss it further if you wish or we can wait till you see the policy and then talk about it some more at the next meeting. I'd, I'd just add that what, what we can uh, prepare is a pilot project uh, would, and there would still require a policy in developing the use of the CCTV. And um, uh, if you're uh, willing to consider a pilot project, it would be interesting to hear what it is you would uh, want to see in a pilot. Thank you, Chief. Claire? Yeah. I, I'm not in support of a pilot project, but um, I'm probably a minority on this commission on that front. Um, I think we've had some good discussion uh, without having anything concrete in front of us, so uh, I would prefer that we postpone further deliberation until we have something um, that we can deliberate over that might actually be implemented, even in pilot project form. Mm -hmm. Make a motion to table until next month. I move to table the discussion until the chief has um, a 
draft of a uh, proposal or pilot project to share with the commission. Second. Seconded by George. All in favor of the motion to table, say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Back on track. Always going to be much shorter meeting, but I was <laughs> <laughs> always a death knell to say that. So, so, uh, <laughs> so we are going to take our break at this time, and when we come back, the chief will make his presentation, which is in your packet, and we look at it. Right. Let's be back. Hey, I saved this from another round. <laughs> well done. <laughs> How you doing, Jesse? You're awful quiet tonight. So you must have a new person. Everyone else is saying a lot of like, good how stuff. How long does it? I mean, it was just all kinds of different uh, new stuff. You don't see something I find. You never learn anything when you're talking about it. Or other people learn things about you you don't want them to. Now, did you change oh, jobs? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, I mean, I've had my own office for three years. Oh, Pretty I Pretty much doing the same stuff. Like, so it's all sound. I saw it on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> That which is oh, yeah. just, just the fact that you sent it out. That's why I'm still doing it. It took about three weeks off of Christmas. You can include that in the next Friday update. No, sat at my parents' house and my wife's parents' house and did a lot of nothing. Yeah. It was great. No, we went to Hawaii and for December with my wife. Thank you. And I didn't touch any sand in the bar. I didn't touch the ocean at all. I read a lot. Oh, that was just right after the first And I just, I read a whole, a whole bunch. I mean, it just turned her sense. Really, it really grabbed it. Of course, then I come up with my own opinion and option on it. God, what was it? What was it? What was it? I can't think of it about a week or two ago. I remember it was a meeting that I think I got a much better No, it was a whole It was a, um, it was, um, 20 feet from startup. Yeah, it was it was about backup singers. Uh -huh. and, and they, I learned more about faces in that movie than just about all the other reading like that uh, in Alabama where they're still protesting busing and, and wanting to have all this back. I mean, from, from, well, from a couple movies, one of them was, uh, anyway, about music. I learned more about races than I did in all my other races. I didn't read football very well. I didn't read at all. But I did have a friend who read that was the focus either. So I think some I it was a really, really great movie. The other one was the recording studio in Alabama. And I started to learn a lot about Alabama about my little work plan. And so, just to record this about the year where we were cranking, my first year they bring the people in. And that would have bitter community. It would have been bitter. 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 And they tossed it out because they couldn't figure out where to put it in the Anyway, I don't the next day, when the father the commission came to vote on it, it was a matter of fact. That's one way to keep the work plan pared down. Do that again. So I got smart this year. My pop. I created this catch all category. I think it's inside No, we have this also. Maybe one day. Yeah, my parents would have been saying, Yeah, I'm not sure. There's this stuff waiting. But look at how far behind we were at the end of our first year in relation to our work. The house they bought in 1978. Probably the work bought back. Well, you got it. You're just always halfway between the scabs and the shaker knowing that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wait till that. Wait till that. Wait till that.
around that. Something that bothered them. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm looking forward to getting back there. We're going to still have to show up. Enough of the city stuff. You know, I've got to do it. It's kind of weird. I can have it. I had to kill you. I feel like since you're not facing your eyes, you probably did. Slowly push our way back in your ghost. It's a feeling about it in New York City. When a lot of young people take a show up. Oh, yeah. I don't know. A month and a half ago, I liked it. I kind of like to hear the only impression that you're listening to their concerns. Yeah, probably. They're the future leaders of the season. When he went into Gamble, he did a colored show. I actually want to give them the impression we're listening to. It's different because they've already gone this far. I think a lot of people aren't. So if that takes a little extra time here, it's wild. It's okay with that. And and we could do that at every meeting. I think everybody has got an idea. Well, it's louder times. Well, I was never in the military. I had to explain to me in other words. It is not just sufficient to do the work, but you should be seen. Not all jobs are like turn. This one kind of is. If I gamble, it's like you go to work. I mean, I think all I used to gamble. It's exhausting. No, I don't want to say that. I don't have a lot of fun with that. Well, I mean, some people just have so many good ideas. Occasionally, I'm poker with friends. No, we're going to do something totally different. You weren't here last time. I was in here. I didn't get a pretty rose drink. Yeah, mine at home. Horrible stuff. I can give you this. That's why I was trying to proceed. When I turned 18, I bought a keto ticket at the store. Yeah, I was just a little trouble. I thought it would last. It was the last thing I ever won on a lottery kind of thing. It wasn't long ago. It was the last thing I ever won. Why, actually, it was the last thing I ever won. I bought it. You know that. This is a lottery ticket. Actually, one time this is going on in the city of America. Oh, yeah. We went to our office. Will you buy me a lottery ticket? Sure. That's the only one I don't think those people should be in police departments, but they are. And then there are officers who are like, why are you filming? Because I'm doing it. Never thank you for all your own I'm not doing anything wrong. And I would actually prefer that it was changed to a question that I could ask you to bring your video in. I know I seem like I'm kind of a And this is all going to change when half the public is wearing these glasses. Because then you aren't going to tell. I can't even tell who's actually recording this. They're just looking at it. I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. It's a curse, and it's a blessing. Yeah. And you can film our film ourselves so we can get film perfectly from 30 feet away. One of the cases in here doesn't work very well. One of the cases in here is where a person was told he was recording. So we go to a car. How was told not to record. Uh, and and the camera was constant. There's no reason. There, there is no reason for either of those two things to occur. Who gave us a good deal? Is that only one side? Do you have the other side? Is that the only one side? Is that the other side? She said, "Is that the only one?" Well, it, the fact that the camera got in our room got confiscated. And a person sitting in the passenger in a car was told that they could not record the occasion. I think there's a problem with both of them. So whether there's a he said or she said in there, I think there's a problem. Did you have the whole recording that he said that? Did, did, did he say the camera has been confiscated? But before or after it was done recording? It's still on the camera. That's correct. The police have confiscated the camera. And it is not as It is not years I managed security crews in the Southeast. We had a few bites. It was full of some fairly nice stuff. Right. And periodically for Christmas we didn't get out and give it to the store. Right. You know what that stuff is? Stuff confiscated after it was thrown at us. So, <laughs> we didn't want it thrown a second time, so they didn't get it back. That may, that may be, and I am I, and I am willing to find out what happened on the rest of it. Because the answer is 
things that I want to know. Yes. Okay. Because what I'm reading right here is, 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 is one set is a point of view of stuff that Carol wrote up, specifically her complaints about watching the proceedings in court, which is where she learned about all it's my name. Actually, what they are. I just today. Or? Yeah. No, I haven't seen it yet. I'm sure it's there. No, I just saw it like a year ago. Well, the neighborhood some contact your council folks to talk about the number of websites for the neighborhood association. Some way I can get it. Oh, um, what I'll probably do is realize I'm over the weekend. The financial structure to pay for such a thing, or even to pay for something. I think it's the. I saw that email. I just check with you. Know, two years ago, somebody set up on yeah, that Facebook, Facebook. Yeah. that same, that exact state. I don't even know why. Neighborhoods, newsletter for all the neighborhoods in Eugene. It's been in existence for Eugene. It has 5,000 subscribers. Oh, really? I thought that was funny. I'm like, man, you really. You got the link to that on there? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm going to pass that along to whoever does your newsletter slash website. We are pretty much at defunct status. Oh, I'm not now. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. People or um. That's what I said before. Oh, really? The same people get together for years now, and then when when one of the guys' wives got cancer, that was just kind of the end of it. Yeah. Friendly going through something slightly different. The same group of people have been doing it for years. Then they invited me on the board. I thought, God, how you kind of shake things up a little bit to get some new people on here mm -hmm. who we'll actually represent more of the neighborhood than just this little circle of friends. Fourteen, sixteen minutes. I'm still being kicked for that three years later on a monthly basis, and sometimes on a daily basis by email from the old guard. I was really unhappy that I had all these new people on the board. On the other hand, we have a 15 member board. Wow. Well, that's one more. That's great. Sometimes, I think this would have been much simpler if I only had to deal with a small number of church jerks. More people, more gets done. I think the chair is trying to reconvene us. We can do that. Thank you, Claire. I can use that voice. I've got a big voice. Or Roosevelt Junior High is. Hey, Joe. I would love a copy of those. Oh, you would? Okay, three copies. Thank you. Okay. Each presentation. Yeah, I thought, I thought they were well done, the presentation. The next item in our agenda is the chief's presentation. And we'll, uh, take okay. questions from you guys. Uh, or would you, would you like to uh, comment? I, I'd hate to go through it since there's, uh, there are many pages. I, I know you've all had it, so I'm just happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, mm -hmm. what is what does that involve? Oh, we had uh, an equipment replacement fund to replace the six-hour uh, inventory of pistols that we've had. We've had the six-hour for quite a few years, uh, and um, we didn't need to spend. I think we spent more than half, but not not the entire equipment replacement fund to buy uh, Glocks to replace the six-hour. And uh, required two days of training since oh, it's okay. a different piece of equipment. That makes sense. Went very well. <clears throat> in, in your New Year's Eve patrol, it sounded like you were on. How was that experience like? It was good. There were a lot of police. It was on a Wednesday. New Year's Eve was on a Wednesday. So that's our overlap day. There was no training that day. So everyone who was assigned to patrol was working. We had many police officers out there. Made a lot of DUI arrests. Uh, and I. I um, Road with uh, Jed McGuire, who's the second, first vice president of the union. He invited me to go out that night. He wanted to, he did kind of a cool thing. He um, had a lottery to let somebody go home, and he worked for them. He works in the violent crimes unit, so it was very generous. In your campus conversation, your, your little campus wide conversation with the black men and, and police violence in America, how did, how did that go? 
Uh, the university hosted a uh, conversation with committee members, uh, mostly, uh, was anybody else, anybody here also there? No. I know there are quite a few people in the room. Uh, and, um, you know, it was about the reaction to the events that have happened around the country, like Ferguson and New York, and um, what our experiences are like here, and uh, what we as a community can be doing together. And what is Alice instructor training? <laughs> uh, anybody, any of you? I know uh, Alice is in golf. Experts on the Alice training? That's, that's the new uh, acronym for an active shooter uh, defense. The, the acronym escapes me. <laughs> but um, yeah, Lieutenant uh, Mozan and uh, Sergeant Soulsby uh, are trained trainers. And uh, they've been uh, providing training first at Bethel and then um, Springfield. And I don't think 4J yet, but 4J is interested. And it's just a different approach to protecting uh, students and staff, uh, which is a little more assertive than the uh, find cover and hide. It's um, taking one's uh, you know, safety and uh, survival into their own hands by blocking doors, proactively moving children, uh, when there's an opportunity attacking the assailant rather than and what we know is that as soon as the assailant <coughs> is confronted in most cases the killing stops so it's based on a great deal of research that's been done over the active shooter and mass murder uh, and since they happened in the United States the last 20 years I know what Alice stands for here we go I looked it up uh, it says it stands for alert lockdown inform counter and evacuate I wonder if nobody knows where <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Can so you repeat like that? Yeah, I'm going to read it off my and screen one, again. And one last question, and it's not really in your report, but I know we have um, the game coming up on Monday night. Are Which game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I, I've, heard, I've heard rumors there's a game. <laughs> um, are you anticipating having a lot of ex, perhaps extra officers on? Yes, we will. Not extra. We'll we'll have the officers uh, working that night. We'll probably have some ready to come ready in to come if in. necessary. Right. But we'll have a party patrol that night. Are you will. Yeah. I I figured there probably would be. Uh, that that troublemaking city council is going to be out in the yeah. Next Ooh, yeah. Whose idea was it to let them <laughs> this? <laughs> yeah, all those canceled meetings. It could get pretty rowdy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Claire. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, uh, I just I, I this might have been brought up at the last meeting and I was absent in response to the Alice training that was done at the for the Bethel School District um, the superintendent sent the City Council and the chief and the mayor and the City Council was CC'd uh, a letter just expressing um, their gratitude for that training and uh, their admiration for the officers that conducted the training and their appreciation of the um, training itself. Um, so as far as Bethel School District is concerned, um, that was a real value to them in terms of preparing their uh, um, staff and students to be safe should something horrible like that occur. Um, I just had a, a kind of uh, One's a little persnickety question on uh, page 12 of your report, the top 10 dispatched crimes and services. There's eight uh, listed. <laughs> At first, I was like, there's 16. No, wait, there's two that's different sections. Actually, that's the same on each page. And uh, then I was just curious what the time frame is for those. Is that a annual? Is that quarterly? It's a rolling 12 months. Okay. And then the uh, all other seem to. Uh, on a number of them seem to be the highest number. So can you give an idea know. of what goes in I don't under? know everything that falls into that. Okay. I don't know. So but just I, things can, that wouldn't know. fall under there those are, other uh, The pieces. obvious uh, calls that we need to go to. Okay. I, I don't have any other questions. Okay, thank you. Anybody there else? could be um, officer-initiated contacts that occur on those properties. James. Uh, Chief, thank you uh, and everyone at the table. Uh, I have just a few things that uh, I have been uh, working on. Of course, I'm always working on something. Uh, this entails a certain type of language and stuff that uh, we use. It's not, not necessarily EPD or anything like that or, uh, uh, as a whole, but uh, this, this is from a national perspective. Uh, we noticed that you know the issue came up talking about uh, demilitarization of you know police departments and stuff. Those mega uh, military, uh, I mean mega police departments and stuff, kind of 
and some of the smaller ones and stuff kind of overemphasize that, you know, who needs a mine sweeper uh, or a tomato uh, uh, festival once a year and stuff. That doesn't make any sense. My, my, my point is that uh, as we move forward, uh, we are community-based policing. That's, we know that the best intelligence that we get is from the citizens and stuff, and, and we are doing, EPD is doing a great job of reaching out to the community members. I know you're out there anytime anybody invites you or you, if you can't make it, you send a representative, which is good is to stay connected with the, police, uh, with the uh, citizens and stuff because, in essence, uh, the police are citizens as well. So we're all in this thing together. And how we interact with each other is very important and our appearances and stuff are very important. And one time you asked me about that stuff. So, uh, the appearances are very important. What I've been also advocating from a national perspective is that uh, when we go out and we look at our uh, uniforms that has the Army combat uh, uniform uh, uh, pattern and stuff, it's something that we probably want to kind of make sure we don't use because when people turn on the news and they see Iraq and Afghanistan, that's the uniform that they see. And they associate that when they see our uh, police officers wearing that as well. And then when we hear the term uh, to get the bad guy, uh, during my tenure in the military, we refer to the bad guy as the enemy. Uh, words are very important, and we can't use that, that type of terminology when we're talking about our citizens and stuff, because now it seems that, that continuous conversation about a division has occurred, us against them. Our police are not against us, and we are not against our police. From a national perspective, uh, and I think that's very important that we recognize that, and these are some of the things that we need to build upon. I agree that the uh, the uniform style with the cargo pockets are necessary and stuff, you know. In the past, our SWAT used to come out in this awesome black or dark blue and stuff, you know, very ominous, very intimidating, but very effective. Same comfortable wear and stuff, but it didn't have only appearance of being an occupied army and things like that. So I think that that's something that we need to work on, along with the terminology of uh, the bad guy, when uh, most of the time is that we're talking about criminals, perpetrators, or assailants. Uh, so wording is very important too, and uh, our constant interaction with, uh, with with the public and stuff. And again, you know, I encourage all of my fellow commissioners. Uh, you know, when we're out there, you see an officer, hey, you know, give us a salute and stuff. You know, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. It 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 shows them, and some of them are probably looking like, you know, well, what the heck is going on if they never experienced that. But it's a sign of appreciation. The same thing that uh, Commissioner Miller did with the cookies, and thank you for that. Uh, you didn't even have to include the entire commission, but that was very nice of you to do that. Uh, I hope the officers did enjoy that. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the use, we're talking about the use of cameras and stuff, and I'll be really brief on this. Uh, if we hadn't had the use of the cameras employed over in France, for example, they never would have been able to see those uh, the perpetrators of that shooting and stuff. They saw, they got the license plate and everything. So there is some value to that. Uh, I'm not going to quite sure as uh, an overall advantage what it would do because it's not going to, cameras will never dis deter crime, uh, it would only capture crime in progress. Uh, so uh, we want to look at, I would like to see us kind of evaluate, you know, what is, what are we going to measure uh, if it's going to be effective because a person that's ill will, ill meaning and stuff is going to uh, do what they're going to do regardless and you can do it right in front of people and stuff. So. Uh, just a few perspectives I want to share. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Oh, Jim? I heard a rumor that there could be a parade on Tuesday if the Ducks win on Monday. Is there, would there be involvement by EPD in that if there was? <laughs> You'd like to have heard about it yeah, by now. They're going to head it up. There's going to be a parade. I, it, it, yeah. There's a game show and a parade. Maybe. Maybe. What in the world are you people talking about? <laughs> um, I've never seen you so red. <laughs> you can answer in hypothetical. Because I wasn't Chief. supposed to say that. No. no, no. Uh, there was a, um, I don't think it was a parade. There was a like a Eugene celebration type of affair after the Ducks won the Rose Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that what it was? It was their national championship or? Uh, their last, anyway, it was downtown, it was uh, pretty successful, and the police department had a uh, role in that, managing traffic and those kinds of things. Well, I guess if there is one, you'll probably find out Monday night. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if something happens Monday, I'm sure there would be an announcement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so the next item on the agenda is our open time report, which I've included in the packet. The chairman has so graciously got together. Thank you, Captain Dirsch, for compiling the numbers. And uh, uh, I, I left uh, time on the agenda in case anybody has further questions about this. I, I'm here to. Uh, <coughs> Yeah. It's not really a question, it's more of a comment that I I agree with Carol. I'm to me this is a remarkably low dollar amount, especially in lieu of what it sounds like she's researched with uh, Carter that it was what two hundred fifty thousand? Sixty. Two hundred sixty thousand and we're looking at a reduction down to less than a hundred thousand. That's mm -hmm. that's a pretty remarkable reduction. I wanna commend the chief and all of his officers and Captains and lieutenants, to looks like they're uh, doing a very, very good job of managing the public's money. In this, so thank you. Yeah, if I could just comment on that. Go ahead. Uh, when uh, the economy went south, uh, the patrol captain at the time was Rich Stronick, and he took the reduction of overtime very seriously. And uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in overtime were saved while he was the captain. Assistant Chief Durr took over the patrol division and uh, took it to a whole new <laughs> level and uh, <laughs> continues to save money and they're just finding efficiencies and smart ways to have our police officers in the right place at the right time so that we're not wasting we're, we're using our overtime as uh, in the smartest possible way. Yeah. And is any of this, oh, this is overtime that we have in this report, it doesn't include overtime that private um, entities pay for is that right or does this every no this, this is, is just court yeah this is okay. just court general fund dollars and okay. what you would find is uh, most of these these dollars go to officers working late shifts Thanks. court only is in session during the day right bill um, not to take away any of the the work that captain Durr has has done on this um, but does some of this court reduction because we're not filing as many cases the DA is not filing because of budget cuts that we're not really having as many court cases the officers are going to could that um, be one of these things yeah that that is a possibility but um, I haven't I, I'd have to do the analysis to know for sure yeah, yeah. just I just always want to know since we are you know filing on a lot of the, the crimes anymore yeah we're used filing to. fewer yeah. mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that up Bill. Anybody else? Questions, Jim? I guess I did just think of, of one other thing. I know this this is talking about court overtime. How about is there? I assume there's probably some standard overtime mm -hmm. officers during the week. How has that been impacted? Has that been going down also? Yeah, that's been coming down. There's been uh, there's spikes when uh, we have the Olympic trials. Uh, we are reimbursed for some of that, but not all of it. And. Um, you know major incidents like that happen but uh, for the last five years it has uh, for the most part come down from over two million dollars a year to I think we're somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 million dollars a year. Okay. Yeah I think it's good uh, to uh, present this in this manner uh, it, because it's fiscal conservative you know uh, how you're spending the money how you best utilizing the money I think this is great uh, uh, sometimes, you know, when you, you expose the belly, you know, to the beast and stuff, you may come up with something that's a little bit of difference. But this is a good projection. I don't know if this is something uh, that's dealing with less or if officers are now using more discretion as to what is actually meaningful. I remember one time uh, at a meeting that we had before the uh, uh, medical marijuana or the marijuana or, or marijuana thing came up on the ballot is that uh, I had uh, suggested or offered that if officers are out there and there are uh, people with like personal, a little low level or something like that, that they not be subjected to the system, you know, I did it when I was on the police department, you know, I told them, hey, dump it out, you know, you see your money going down a drain, if I see you doing it again, then your money's going down a drain. If a student, I call the parents and things like that to get the parents involved. I think it made more sense because uh, it, it allowed uh, parents to be part of the process of guiding their children. 
uh, and not so much as uh, having someone taking them to a system and stuff that there is a dark hole and they never return. So I don't know if some of that may have been a consideration, officers using more discretion, you know, how officers actually interact. Uh, what is the perception of the people? So I think that possibly a lot without having the data, as the chief says, that, you know, it would be interesting to find out, you know, uh, if, if some, none, or all of those things are factors and stuff, and if our behavior in general has changed. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, over the last uh, four or five years, our calls for service have steadily gone up. Our arrest numbers have steadily gone up. And in the last two years, the numbers of uh, uniform traffic citations that we issue have gone up. So I don't think we're doing less enforcement. The DA's office, as Bill pointed out, uh, has filed 26% for <coughs> felony charges in the last two years. Thank you. <coughs> so I was, um, I was curious about the logistics of how this was done. So maybe it's a question for Captain Dirk. So if someone's on night shift, have, have you done this by? Because I don't know what the union contract says. I know like our engineering union contract, if if they get called in, they get paid three hours automatic overtime. So is it that? You have somebody on night shift this court you try to schedule court in the morning and if they're on swing shift you try to schedule it in the afternoon at the beginning of their shift or how, yeah. how have you exactly done that i'm just curious we we uh we work with the union court and they they look at officer schedules and do the best as possible but uh looking at the court overtime at all uh, overall it's your night shifts that carry a majority of the court mm -hmm. overtime so we really don't have uh the ability to uh, to manage that because it, no matter what, they're going to be coming on overtime. And with our contract, it's a, it's a minimum of four hours. Mm -hmm. So, so if, you, if you start looking at breaking down uh, those, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, reasonable what's, what's going on. So if you're paying them for four hours anyway, do you try to get as many packed into that time as you can? <laughs> well, they're usually, by the time they respond to court and everything else like that, it usually it's it's four hours and we don't call them and say, hey, you got to come back to work because if we do that, then now suddenly we have issues with them having to come mm -hmm. back to the shift yeah. later on at night. So mm -hmm. we run into right. fatigue problems and things like that. Right. We always have just some contract issues. So. Yeah. That call back or double back, whatever they call it. Yeah. Thank you. Since we're finished with that item, so we're going to move on to this was on our work plan, the impound vehicles, and uh, <clears throat> the policy. You all had a copy of it in your packet, and so uh, you can take comments or suggestions or motions. Uh, we need to <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Matt, will you, uh, would you mind outlining this for us just briefly? And telling yeah, us, uh, sure. Um, this, uh, this was published in, uh, like you can see down there at the bottom, late February, and it was about the same time that we published, in around the same time, two other policies. These kind of came out as a package with our search and seizure policy and uh, searches and inventories of detained persons. <laughs> so... Uh, these came out all together because they all kind of, um, they deal with, this deals with inventories, which is not a set, which is separate from a search, but they all deal with the discovery of property that's ultimately sometimes, or can ultimately be used in, in criminal cases where then somebody, a judge, would have to rule on the properness of the search. So we tried to publish them all together. We also tied in, um, there were about, I think there were three separate policies governing impounds of one sort or another. There was one for traffic offense impounds. There was another one for safekeeping of vehicles. Um, so we kind of made this a, a one-stop shopping uh, for impounds for you know as a re as mo this really serves as a reference for officers the intent is this the search and seizures and the inventories of detained persons you know to read this you know quarterly and just it'll help you them brush up on 
uh, search and seizure and uh, laws and case laws and rules around uh, impounds and searches. So um, there's the purpose and scope. The, there's ORS 809-720 that grants the authority to impound for certain offenses um, when, when the officer makes stops for, and, they're, and they're listed right there. A uh, lot of lo local agencies have been going through the motions, particularly Lane County. Uh, they just had a recent uh, cup two separate court cases where their inventory policy at the jail was deemed unconstitutional because it was overly broad. Uh, so we made sure, uh, we, this, this was long before any of those cases though, we, these weren't even in the wind yet, but we made sure that our, um, we worked with the district attorney's office to really make sure that the, the, um, the, the search components of this inventory, it's not a search, but the, the, the looking at people's property component of this policy was really well vetted through the DA's office because we wanted to make sure that you know, it, it, it jived with all the case law that, that was out there. So it's uh, one thing you'll notice when you read it is, is it, it will sound pretty compulsory to the officer. One of the components of why the search, some searches are deemed unconstitutional is because they're, they appear to be arbitrarily applied by the officers. We've made sure that we've, we've given them pretty clear guidance on when and why they will conduct a search. So we, we're, we're not arbitrarily searching certain cars and not searching other cars. Um, I'm sorry, I, I use the word search. I meant to say inventory because there is, there is a difference. Um, so we, we, we've made it uh, non-discretionary for the most part. There are, obviously there are some exceptions. Um, so there's a sentence in there that kind of, we have to balance law enforcement priorities. If there's a, you know, if there's a murder suspect that's running around up the street from your inventory, I mean, that's an obvious reason to maybe discontinue the inventory of that vehicle, allow that vehicle to remain and, and go on, because there's a higher law enforcement purpose. So uh, that, that's really the only exception that we're giving officers to, to conducting some of these uh, inventories. Uh, it talks about where officers are to search. There is a significant, of any lawyer who sits on this, this board or anybody who follows this knows that there is a significant amount of case law around vehicle inventories, searches, and the, and the presentation of the, that evidence into court. Um, so uh, we've given some pretty clear uh, guidance to officers about where they're to search and then where they're not to search and to just stop and apply for a search warrant. Um, We've given them instructions on uh, what they'll look for and why. That's one of the components that was lacking in the Lane County policy. I'm using that as an example. I'm not trying to knock their, their policy writing. I'm just because it's recent. Uh, they didn't have any real scope about where and why they were searching. This, this pretty well uh, enumerates a lot of that. And then we've given officers instructions for what to do with those, with those items when they find it. Uh, finally, the last, last component of it is the, the impound hearings. Um, I've been a police officer for over 10 years. I've never even heard of an impound hearing going. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's clearly described on the back of the impound form. Uh, and I talked to many veteran officers who've been here you know, a, a decade or two longer than I have. And, and they're... Uh, they're not they're not utilized very frequently, but we but we still because it's still an option to the to the uh, person whose vehicle is impounded. We, we we give some guidance about what to do about that. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, first George. I have a I just I was reading this policy and the other or what, when I got it and I was thinking in my businesses I own auto repair businesses. And everything I drive and everything my employee drives during business hours are insured. Mm -hmm. But we don't have proof of insurance. I don't give my technicians the proof of insurance to carry with them in every test drive they do. Right. But, and I don't know, we don't search the glove box to make sure, as a matter of fact, I don't even like to go into glove boxes. <laughs> right. You wouldn't believe what we find sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can feel you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but that would be a case where by these uh, uh, 
could be impounded if if one of my uh, employees was pulled over and there is no you know let's say sometimes people people bring in their vehicle uh, it's been broken down for a year and they bring it in and and finally have it fixed so that would be a case where a car could be impounded I well you know, there's discretion I understand sure and we, we've given the the Driving uninsured is a, is a very easily uh, proven, I mean, statute in, in, in a court. There's somebody's driving and they don't have their insurance card. It's effectively, well, I don't know, I don't have a language, I can't regurgitate right. it, but it's like you said, I'm driving without my insurance card or about proof of insurance. Um, we've made sure that, we, that we're not going to, I, myself, you know, somebody who ought to know better has uh, left my valid insurance card or you know got the new one in the mail and I've still got the old one from two months ago sitting in my car I, I mean I, that, that has happened to me we're, we're not trying to uh, in this policy we're not trying to identify those types of cases as right, right. there goes the car um, you know it's we'll impound the vehicle only if we can establish with reasonable certainty there is no insurance for the vehicle um, I, I hate to you know speculate or kind of war game this but my, my general feeling is that uh, officers understanding of the policy would be that if there was nothing else you know going on then this is a work car and, and we don't have the insurance well, we're part. working on a we could car. I mean officers all the time we have a cell phone we we call and, and verify proof more often than not it's when, when we have an insurance card that maybe they, we don't believe is valid we can contact insurance companies okay. there are there are easy ways to verify that okay. there's insurance for the vehicle uh, and we'll oftentimes go go that route if somebody ah, I don't have the insurance card with me I left it at home, or I just got in the mail. I forgot to put it in the car. You know, we we get that a lot, and, and and I think make the appropriate decision virtually every time. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question about? That? So, are they cited, and then they have to just bring the proof to court to get the um, citation dismissed? Is that how it works? That's yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. In a nutshell, even if if if. Uh, if we were in that situation and, and I was going to err on the side of I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I I believe Mr. Brody but he's assuring me that he does I could issue him a citation and the courts have been, have taken the um, you know, proof of insurance at the time of the stop and said well, this this case is dismissed and that's usually a perfect remedy for for that. Thanks. Thanks for that. Following up to that in the back on the information sheet they're allowed to bring that proof of insurance to the information desk and provide uh, proof that they have insurance and show that to the clerk the uh, person at the information desk yeah they have to bring all that stuff to the to the front to the records counter who does the release they don't have to wait for court they can no bring no it there they, and they it's, can get the you do not need to wait for your impound hearing or your court okay. you're encouraged on the back somewhere it says that okay um, yeah I saw, I saw I thought I saw that but I wanted yeah to yeah they, they'll want to bring all that, that stuff they didn't have to wait to court to, to get it back okay mm -hmm. thank you all right so then next is Jim um, <coughs> I got a few questions not 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 too difficult. On page two, where it talks about driving while suspended, mm -hmm. it talks about the second offense. Mm -hmm. What happens on the first offense? Well, I mean, I, I would say that that's, a, that's an instance where we'd leave it to officer discretion. Um, there are instances where, uh, I, I can, I'll, I'll speak to, just from my own experiences. I've, I've stopped drivers who have had their license suspended and genuinely don't know. They really do not know that their license has been suspended for whatever reason. They could have moved and inadvertently um, not kept up with the, the DMV notices. Um, they could have gone through a series of, um, but most often what happens is they're, they've com they're completing, they're in the process of completing some sort of um, assignment for the court because of maybe another uh, incident and they would done what they thought was complete that series of steps and maybe hadn't in the court has suspended their license um, so I mean there are instances where it's the first time that's why we don't give the direction that if the, the person's sus their driving privileges are suspended will sus you know, inventory and, and, and tow their vehicle every time we're looking for here for the uh, 
For the repeat. Yeah, the constructive knowledge that they know their sus license is suspended, they're still continuing to drive with a suspended license. Um, uh, you know, there there are people who who will have a license suspension and and not not genuine. So you're obviously not going to let them drive a car at that point, because, right? Because yeah, you know. Mean, so do you just park it somewhere that's that's safe and allow them somebody else to come get the car? Or I've done that before. Okay. Yeah, allow them to leave it lawfully parked. There might be a licensed driver they can call, mom or dad. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, there might be a pe person in the car. Who's, I mean, if, if everything else is, you know, the, the car is insured and everything else administratively is right with the vehicle and they have a sober licensed driver, and there's no reason they can't drive the car. Okay, a, a couple other questions on on some of the acronyms. FEU, Forensic on, on page, okay, and that's what I thought it might be. And VNU office, it's on the same page, page three, it's about, it says place the keys with the vehicle. Oh, place oh, the, 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 the vice narcotics office. That's right. a. Okay. There's a. It, we don't have a vice narcotics team any longer. It's our INET team, but people would know it in the department. There's an office door at two in Lincoln, where inside of it there's a pegboard for all the vehicle. Right now, all our impounded vehicles, uh, for evidentiary reasons and safe keep tows, are stored at our two in Lincoln facility, and that's where that pegboard is. <coughs> Um, so that's a that's a description for the officers. Okay. Well, I guess officers who were hired five years five or more ago back. that would even know what VNU was. So, yeah. And I think the last question I think I have um, down at the bottom of that same page, page three, where it's talking about the vehicle inventory policy and the areas that you're commanded to search. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see anything. I I wondered where like my wife's vehicle has. It's a hatchback, and in the base of the hatch, it has a, a storage. It's in some cars, it might be a car storage unit, but in this case, you can lift it up, and it's a storage unit where you can, you know, put things into. I didn't really see it. I don't know if that would be considered a, a trunk, or I didn't really see that as one of the areas that's your command to search, unless you're calling that a console or something. I. Yeah. Well, that would be one of those cases where I could decide at the stop that that's a component of the trunk and another person would maybe disagree and we'd have to let a, a court uh, decide. But we don't have every specific hidey hole on the vehicles um, uh, identified as to whether or not we, you will search it just because we have a just exhaustive list. But, um, you know, if you're, just, if you're describing to me just a, just a hole or, or a kind of a a glove boxy type thing in the trunk space I would I would say that that's a okay. that's an area that's objectively likely to contain a valuable a firearm and, it is. Or, it and is. that you that I would tell him one of my officers to search that area and if somebody uh, an attorney disagreed with I guess we'd have to go to the judge no, that's why I, that's why I just was trying to avoid yeah. that that situation if that was something that could be added to this because I I didn't really see a good definition in those other areas for it but I'd hate to have to lose a court case because of it. somebody said, oh, no, it's not included here, so you don't have There's a lot of hair splitting around vehicles. Yeah. I'm sure searches. there are. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have Jesse, Edward, Joe, and Claire in the queue. All right. There is hair splitting because it's important stuff. Right here sure. it says an inventory is a non-investigatory procedure, and everybody knows perfectly well that they're used to investigate. It's an easy way to get a look into the car without a warrant. Um, that said, the Lane County Jail inventory policy did get struck down for being overly broad. And what I thought about this one for a while, and I haven't had the chance to challenge it, but I think it is challengeable because it says you can go into any container that is going to contain valuable items, prescription drugs, or hazardous materials. Tiny little containers can hold those things. So that's pretty much what the Lane County Jail's policy, which the DA may have vetted as well. I think it might need a new look taken at it in light of the cases that struck down that policy. Um, and as far as the impound hearings, you never see them because I think you get two days to ask for one and nobody realizes they do because it's in the fine print on the back of, the, of what they get. Um, but Lane County, again, they just lost a 20 they got a $25,000 judgment against them plus attorney fees 
for a simple tow that happened. Um, the person challenged it. The sheriff did not allow the uh, person at the hearing to look at the evidence. Um, and they sued based on that. They said there was no due process in this hearing. And uh, the jury awarded them a pretty good sum. Everybody was impressed with that. This doesn't, this impound hearings part of the policy doesn't really address like what your responsibility is with discovery. And based on that case, there absolutely is a discovery uh, requirement or obligation to, to give the person due process to prepare for the hearing. And that's all I've got. Okay, Edward. I'm looking at the prescription drug section and I'm putting together a hypothetical situation which is, this is my 90-year-old mother. I go to visit her in Washington State. She needs me to go to the pharmacy and pick up her med refill. It's Norco. It's OxyContin. It's some powerful thing. Mm -hmm. She loans me her car. The taillight falls off of it between there and downtown Squim, Washington. And I am pulled over by an officer who says, huh, what's this? Painkillers, but your name's not on the bottle. This policy would indicate to me that an officer would be able to seize that medication because it does not belong to the driver occupant of the vehicle. So I'm just wondering how we deal with legitimate cases of someone at least temporarily possessing a medication that does not have their name on the prescription label. Now, the obvious solution is you've got a cell phone. You can call my mom and say, did you send your son to do that? But not everybody has those those resources or connections. So I'm a little concerned about that, that there's a kind of a hole there that people going about their lawful business could fall right into. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. I have a, I have a fault question to that because I stepped out, so I might have missed something. But wouldn't the vehicle have to be impounded? He'd have to be yeah, you'd have to driving, be driving without insurance, and ha they would. You would well, let's let's take it to a larger case. Yeah, it is it is some reason that the vehicle should be impounded. One 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 person at a time here, please. Right. Go ahead. Okay, you have, it's your question. Well, no, you, no, you raised a, a good point. I'm just saying all of the things being equal. So the vehicle is impounded for some reason, even though it's not something I did necessarily. So let's remember, officers apply these things slightly differently. I just see the possibility here, not so much for abuse by officers that can't see the, the percentage in that, but that someone could litigate based on having the medication they were bringing home to their mom taken away from them. So I'm just... I'm not saying, oh, you should change this. I'm just putting this on your radar. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, and Joe, I have Claire and then myself in the q and a Okay. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have is the level of fees. I mean, you have a towing fee, you have an impound fee. I mean, what are these, what are the numbers associated with that? In other words, um, and I guess regarding that packet of stuff that, that Carol gave us, um, one of the things was a car that was impounded. And apparently it was impounded because he was supposedly um, drive, either driving while suspended or, or one of these other things. However, it turned out, as indicated in there, to be an error on the part of the DMV. And um, so what happens in a case where the person turns out to be innocent of the thing that caused the car to get impounded um, when they are now charged with all of these fees, including a towing fee and the like? So in other words, um, what happens to all those fees if the char A, the charges are dropped, or uh, it turns out the charges were not uh, correct to even start? So an amount for the fees and what happens in those cases? Well, I don't really know. I, I, I know that these, uh, I'm sure there are mistakes that have happened at the DMV. Uh, and there's mistakes that have happened by officers. Uh, aside from just trusting the fact that anybody, like any reasonable mistake can always be, especially when there's a paper trail like this coming through a police department, that, that it, it would be remedied. And, um, but I don't have a specific answer for you, sir, about it what to do. I can only speculate that it just a reasonable error on the part of the officer, DMV, uh, etc. could be 
tracked and, and, and repaid. No, 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 I don't think anybody at the police department would, would uh, decide to just take the money and run, so to speak. Ben say, well, Manny, Manny, move. <coughs> DMV made an error. And, uh, and I don't think that's what you're inferring either, but uh, I don't know the answer. Yeah, in other words, a long way of saying I don't know. I, I think, the, I think the, the, the appropriate phrase is to be made whole. Yeah. Um, but the, the issue is that if someone does come under a circumstance of that nature, and I don't know, you know, I mean, the whole question of uh, he said, she said regarding that packet is still there. In other words, we don't, we have one side of the story. Is that, is that correct? Um, uh, I mean, there's several, there's several issues that are, are pointed out in that packet, and I think they're quite relevant. Yeah, I can help answer that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, we get these claims uh, occasionally, not often, but uh, the, the circumstance that you described isn't one that I remember ever seeing. But we'll arrest someone for DUII and then um, bring them to the police department and uh, have them take the uh, blood alcohol toxilizer tests, draw blood and urine, and we won't find evidence that they're intoxicated by mm -hmm. anything. And. Uh, They'll make a claim that they now have to pay their tow fees, and they don't think they should have to. Mm -hmm. And so we review those uh, from the perspective of what the officer knew at the time that he made the arrest. And if there was probable cause at that time uh, that uh, the person was driving under the influence, then we would not repay them. If the officer made mistakes and arrested someone without probable cause, then we would repay that claim. In the suspended license uh, circumstance, someone made the claim to the police department, we'd probably deny it because the record at the time the officer made the stop said that the person was license was suspended and we have to go based on the DMV record and the DMV is another place that they could make a claim and perhaps be made whole by the state. Because hmm. it's, it's not just the fines that are involved. I mean, now you've got to transport yourself around, you've got huge amounts of inconvenience, you go up against a system you have no experience going up against, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, um, you know, that individual walks away with a pretty nasty feeling about the entire experience, and I certainly wouldn't blame them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I look at a, polic a policy like this, and I, I can, you know, I, I mean, at, in a certain level, it makes it makes good sense. But at another level, um, if mistakes are made, how does the person recover um, mm -hmm. from that? And um, I mean, there there is a we've talked about this before. I mean, I had had a personal experience with having relatives of a roommate show up who wound up being homeless and being told by the landlord that they couldn't sleep in the car in the driveway and winding up on the street and, you know, having the car taken with all of their worldly possessions, including money, okay, uh, in, left in the car. And, um, you know, of course, they don't have the money to pay the impound fee or the towing fee or the storage fee or anything else. So it's gone, okay. Um, seems like a fairly significant punishment for being, um, you know, homeless. And, you know, I, you see a, po a policy like this, but it, you know, it, it creates those situations. I mean, is there any, are there any thoughts about how to, you know, get past something like that? Yeah, we grapple with this one all the time. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're responsible for the taxpayers' dollars, and so we're, um, we're protecting them in the best way possible. Uh, I did talk with a couple of community members who asked, is there a community response to the situation that you're asking about? And there might be. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, you know, this is a tough policy, and I, I think there's a lot of issues here um, that are really not even close to being addressed. So, I don't know, just, just my opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire and myself. Thanks. Um, Joe's questions were a little bit along the lines of what I was wondering about because the, the, um, that particular policy doesn't address situation where cars are towed, like when they get the boot, cars that are booted, 
and then towed um, for parking violations or being parked illegally or being parked uh, as a derelict vehicle. So is there a separate policy that governs those instances? No, there's a procedure like you're talking about um, <laughs> it happens like this. This is kind of a funny anecdote. Uh, there's a couple of these snatch and grab kind of tow companies and more than once I've gone to a UUV uh, where there have been people who've uh, not wanted to park at the adult, adult bookstore but have parked at the taco place next door because it doesn't it won't offend their friends if, if they drive by and see oh there's Bob's car in the adult bookstore and <laughs> lo and behold they come out and their car has been towed, towed by to be determined tow company uh, Five 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 one 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 one. You know, call us next weekend. Um, when those to the, there there are ordinances that the tow companies have to have to follow. So we're we're clued in on when vehicles get towed, they have to call uh, our records, and they will kind of make make a note of it. So what it does is prevent all these cars from being reported stolen because sometimes they get in the system that way it's a stolen car my car's been stolen and then the officer will be driving to the take the report and they'll be driving behind the tow truck you know that has the car on it I mean, I, literally that's happened before um, so we don't have any hand in those impounds and we do the inventories to protect the vehicles because we are taking custody of the vehicle we do it to, in the situations like Mr. Tyndall was raising. These are sometimes everybody, their last worldly possession is inside there. And we do the inventory to protect their property. We do it to protect the city, the city from uh, false and fictitious claims. But in those instances, ma'am, we don't have any hand in it. So, um, you know, we, we're only notified by plate number and VIN that, that the vehicle's been impounded. And those impounds go to... Not impounded, uh, towed. Toe, those yeah. tows go to the tow lot. Yeah. Yeah. We so. only use four tow companies. The tow companies we use are Vetted, uh, Oregon Tow Truck Association, uh, OTTA. Um, and those companies, every year they have to reapply for the contract. They're basically vendors that provide a contract to the city, so they have certain things that they have to... Uh, um, They've got a bargain. They've got to uphold to us. Um, they have to have certain, um, you know, licensing and bonding. It's not, we don't just call any tow company. Come get this truck. There's four very distinct. Several of them have been used. I, we've used Rays and uh, AAA since I've been a policeman, and some other companies have come on and, and not been as reputable as they should, and they've been removed from the list. Um, but. So there's a, a separate process and procedure for ticketed vehicles getting towed off the street. Yes, and a, I don't even think any longer that a city parking, like you, like Matt gets so many tickets that my car gets booted. We won't tow the vehicle. I think, I think the boot just remains on it until it gets like storage on street or something like that. I mean, until we can determine it's been like an abandoned vehicle. A lot of times those, those we aren't able to inventory those because we can't get into it because they're abandoned if they're not open. Okay. okay. I, I have, I do know people who have their cars okay. that were just broken down and they don't have, I don't, I don't have a driveway, I don't have a garage, <laughs> my car doesn't work, it's got to sit in the street. Mm -hmm. And then technically that's a parking violation and my car could get towed and that happened yeah. to someone um, who you know lost her car because she okay, couldn't yes. go and get it out of yes. the lot, um, but that's not necessarily a police enforcement. But that is a city policy, and, and maybe there's maybe this isn't the place to, to look at it. But I think it goes to what Joe was speaking to, um, and I I also wonder if the court might have a role in the times where someone you know is found not guilty or it was an error, not maybe the police officer's error, but somebody's error that the fees could be reimbursed. Um, what are the, the rationale for the various fees? We have to pay the towing company for their service. Right. And what about the impound fee? Well, there's there's administrative costs that we'd have to recoup at the city. And beyond that, I don't know. I don't. Uh, the chief, I'm sure, has a better that, idea than I do. That's, that's business that uh, the violator has with the tow company. 
So the only uh, fee that they pay to the city is uh, the processing of the impound. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, myself and then George and Q. So um, I wanted to point out that something that um, Commissioner Lorkey mentioned was the uh, fact that they had searching in at all types of containers to find evidence of a crime. And I, in this policy, I happen to notice that in uh, section uh, it's uh, 510.4 at the very bottom, just above 510.5, there's a paragraph that does explain that if an officer develops probable cause to find that there might be evidence of a crime in the vehicle, he must seize the vehicle, especially if it's a cont I mean, container rather, especially if it's a container designed specifically and uniquely not to be opened. He has to seize it and then get a probable cause search warrant. So it doesn't necessarily give a person carte blanche to just take whatever they find in the car. If they do believe, for some reason, have some other evidence to believe that there's, uh, there's evidence in there of a crime, they need to go get a search warrant. So uh, I think that's a sound policy, and I think it does at least not reach the level of overly broad uh, seizure of everything in the car and makes it uh, a good viable policy. And I just wanted to point that out when that was mentioned earlier. Um, so after that, George? I, I you're good? don't need it anymore. Anybody else you want to talk about? Are we ready to uh, recommend the motion to approve? Or? I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, Whole policy, am I using the right word there? Yeah. Impound. Mm -hmm. Policy 510. Policy 510. All right, there we go. Second to the motion? Second. Further discussion? There's one comment I'd make. Uh, we, our attorneys uh, reviewed this for uh, Fourth Amendment questions. Um, so it's interesting to hear your comments. And we'll, uh, we'll have them. I mean, it would be helpful to know what the cases are that you're referring to so that we can compare the policy that the sheriff's office had to this one to make sure we're still dealing with the ideal language. <clears throat> May I ask real quick? Uh, okay, Tamara had oh, her. Go ahead. All right, she's deferring to you. Um, okay. I, that case came out, I think it was within the last two months. Hmm. So if they haven't been reviewed since then, it's worth looking okay. at. And, and I'm going to vote against the motion just because I think it's, they're pretty, um, breaking cases that really changed what, how, I think, inventory policies are going to be looked at. Well, we'll do that research. Okay. Right. Sergeant Lowen will have that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know this is discussion on the motion, but I had a question that I neglected to ask. On the first page, there was a, under, just above 5.10, 510.2.1, it says a vehicle may not be impounded if the vehicle would be likely to endanger the offender or passengers in the vehicle. I don't, I don't understand what circumstances there be if you would not impound a vehicle because it might be likely to endanger the off, the offender, sorry, or passengers in the vehicle. What, I, um, I can't understand what that means. I've stopped your car in the middle of the day on I-105 and it's you and your little baby daughter and you don't have a cell phone and I'm being called away to a call and um, it basically we're avoiding the idea that I've left you stranded downtown and felony flats or on a busy roadway where it's dangerous for you to be without some kind of barrier between you and traffic okay. this is this is just one of those baked-in exceptions where an officer can say this isn't the right time for this inventory and impound of the vehicle because this would be more dangerous to this person or okay thanks and I apologize if that's already been asked well, is that thank you Claire uh, <coughs> with respect if we can avoid the use of the term felony flats to refer to any part of our city that would no. be no. most appreciated <laughs> by the city council <laughs> that's uh, in your uh, zone oh it could be anywhere uh, <laughs> you didn't but answer we don't want to answer <laughs> I have the Broadway floor. Broadway and all <laughs> at two in the morning. Okay. Um, uh, I I will vote in favor of uh, uh, supporting the current policy, but I would uh, ask the chief if you do that review with the new information, the new court information, if you could share that as a follow up with the commission. That would be very appreciated. Yes, we'll do that. Okay. Any further discussion? 
not call a question. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. You don't like for me to train over there, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you broke our perfect record, You like that one? No, it's okay. Okay, we've now reached the end of our um, agenda, and that's comments. Commissioner, closing comments. So, who would like to go? Sir. So um, I apologize for missing the meeting last month. I don't know if uh, Carter or whoever was in here in her stead shared. Jeremy, uh, I've uh, taken a new job and uh, I went to a special training that week, but uh, my absence should be the exception from now on rather than the rule and I should be able to get here on time at 5.30 um, because my other job had a standing conflict that went till six o'clock um, uh, in my last job. So. Happy to have a new schedule that will let me be here more fully and uh, really appreciate all your work and also very much appreciate public comment and also folks that uh, stay through the whole meeting and listen to our discussion. I think it's really valuable. Which direction? That direction. I went first last time. I'll go last. <laughs> I'll pass. Okay. I'll pass. Well, uh, as always, it's nice uh, to see everyone. You know, I'm very uh, uh, privileged to be among this group of uh, thought, forward-thinking folks and stuff, and how we relate and respond to the needs of the community and represent the community, and more importantly, the community connection with the police department and vice versa. So uh, this is uh, uh, it's going 25th, 2K15 is probably going to be full of a lot of uh, a lot of. A lot of bangs and bucks and stuff, but I think that if we think logically and stuff and be respectful and stuff, that we will come through this thing in flying colors. And finally, for me, it is also bitterly sweet because I have completed my academic portion of my doctoral process and I'm all but dissertation. I am done. All right. Congratulations. 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 What a relief. <laughs> Pass on any comment. Um, yeah, I do. I, I, I still have some issues around that packet that we have, and I'm wondering um, if there's any way, um, you know, the, the comment was it's a he said, she said. So if we can get the other perspective on those particular cases or, you know, on that kind of thing, because I'm, I'm very curious as to how that got resolved or if it did or um, what the what the claims are on it? Um, I just I don't know. I just I just think we're walking into territory where we shouldn't be going. This our charter specifically prohibits us from investigating or uh, addressing issues of individual complaints by people. And so there is there are again three avenues for people to make complaints to, to and that's internal affairs, civilian mm -hmm. review board, and the auditor. So if there is an issue with what's been publicized in that packet, um, those people should be taking it to the proper people to investigate it. And the commission should not get involved in the individual nitty gritty work of whether somebody who's telling the truth and who's not. If we get into that, we're, we're never gonna get our stuff done. That's just my opinion. Have well, we got anybody else that has comments tonight? On, on that or as we go Any, around the no, table? No, this is our comment. No, comment. <laughs> Are we going around the table? We're going around the table. Okay. So. Um, again, I want to thank everybody that came out, and as was already mentioned, the people that, that stayed for the whole meeting, it's great to see. And I was kind of, since I have a good view of Carol tonight, I saw her nodding her head a lot tonight. Good so meeting. she liked um, a lot of the comments. And I know we talked about municipal courts, so I know that's <laughs> her kind of pet area. And um, I saw I saw her nodding a lot there, too. So, um, And it wasn't because she was nodding off to sleep. She was nodding some good positive stuff. So thank you. Okay. Um, so I was I was a little bit disappointed we didn't have the CCTV discussion continue today. So I'll look, be looking forward to that in a future meeting. Thanks. Thank you, George. And I want to celebrate a 2015 games with all due respect to you. Uh, thank you. By the way, I'm I'm getting more of warmer fuzzies. From, I mean, warmer fuzzies <laughs> from this group, and I really really appreciate everybody's I really think flexibility this group on this. Warmer fuzzies a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, one of the boards I mean, it's wearing off. Okay. Uh, 
I also want to say I uh, last weekend at the art walk I went up and talked to three uh, police officers who was on bicycles and it was uh, identified myself and they were real actually I did a police ride along with Bo Rankin and he didn't remember me though which is good uh, but anyway it was a very pleasant uh, I want Tamara that was really neat you bringing cookies down and one of the things I thought about when we had the uh, motorcycle officer that was in the hospital some flash just went by me and that was you know I think it would have been really nice and I don't even know how to do the logistics of it is to uh, have a card sent out you know uh, just to say hey get well so to improve the relationships between the police commission and uh, the uh, uh, the the officers on the street and one last comment I was at 13th and Chambers looking to my left and seeing an officer at night on his computer he looked over and he waved at me which I thought was just really really neat so uh, I think there has been a tremendous readjustment of uh, at least they seem to be more friendly but that could be because I'm more friendly thank you you get fuzzy <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Eugene, it's in our mission statement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you. Again, uh, from my perspective, thank you all for coming and conducting the business that we have to do. Uh, our Vice Chair Tamara Miller is exactly correct. We have to get back on the work plan and go through, and we will. We have planning to do uh, plan our agenda, so we will try to find it, make sure there's nothing left on our work plan to do that that we uh, will get this done. And remember, we have a retreat scheduled May 2nd. Uh, we still have, do we have a location yet? We do not yet. I know. So Jeremy is working on that, and we'll get uh, we'll get that to you, and that'll be something for our next work plan. In the meantime, thank you all for your uh, thoughtful deliberations tonight. Thank everyone here for your comments and uh, consideration of this discussion. Thank you all, and good night. We Thanks, had, Bob. We had an ED. Bob, did the dates we had warm and fuzzies <laughs> on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> really? So, really? Yeah. Oh, or every, every two months. Yeah. 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 Did you have a prescriptive yeah. warm and fuzzies? Yeah. Warm, well, it was, it's but McKenzie. You take your warm and fuzzies. It's McKenzie personnel, which helps uh, uh, the. Uh,